Thank you. All right, which is my cup of coffee here. I'm gonna get rid of this one because. Oh, that's mine, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's, feel a little bit better. Than, okay. Um, so, uh, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, I'm substituting for my colleague, Jeff Wall, who couldn't do this. So of course I was up until midnight last night trying to put together a talk um, for you. Uh, and uh, what I decide to do is, because I can't give his exact talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about sort of a related area. He was going to talk about breast cancer. Uh, my lab works on several aspects of metabolic disease. Uh, you heard a little bit from Ken about our interest in organoids and making human synthetic islets in addition. I'll show you a little bit about organoids uh, in this presentation, a little smattering of that. Um, but we work on two kinds of cancers. One is uh, pancreas cancer, pancreatic cancer, which is one of the deadliest cancers, and another one which is about equally as bad, which is colon cancer. These are two that are, that are amongst the most difficult to treat. Uh, and the reason that they are difficult to treat uh, uh, is because the science is not anywhere near as developed uh, as it is for some of the other cancers. And if you don't really understand uh, the underlying science, then you really have, you're underpowered for using uh, medicines to develop new therapies. And so I'm gonna tell you about why it's hard uh, to understand some of these diseases and some you know, unusual ways that you can actually uh, ask questions that give you new ways to approach what the disease actually is. Uh, and when you have these new ways, you can come up with potentially new kinds of therapies. You know, I have no idea which is the clicker because there's like many. I'm gonna have to tap the button. Okay, so uh, the, and this work that I'm gonna talk about is principally uh, spearheaded by um, uh, Ting Fu, postdoc in my lab. Uh, and oh, yes, yes. You're ask, actually asking me to do something that's electronic here. Okay, it's plugged in. Okay. All right. Let's just see. I skip. Uh, where's my, where's my, oh. Can you tell me how to do this? Because it's not like, oh, wait, wait. You know, it's here, but. Can you just drag it over that screen? What if you exit the presentation and then go back in? Okay. As teachers, we're so used to this. Okay, okay now <laughs> what? Now you should get started. Yeah. So now you can go back. Okay, now I can just, just do it. Yes. Wait, okay. There you go. Yep. Now it should work. That worked. Awesome. Okay. Now, and the magic about doing that is my clock started over. All right. <laughs> Um, so uh, this work is being done by uh, Ting Fu, who uh, is an outstanding uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, in my lab, uh, and it's one that she inherited from a uh, former postdoc, and that's how projects continue. They're kind of handoffs, and one person works on a story. Uh, typically, if you get a good story, uh, it gets published in a good journal, and it, you get a job, and we get a grant. That's basically how it works, and then that grant uh, uh, funds the next person that's coming in. So, um, now it's not that simple, but roughly speaking, uh, you have talented people who really come up with some interesting ideas. And you know, so what I'm going to talk about is risk. Everyone knows about what you've heard about cancer risk, but what do you what do you really think risk is from a scientific term? It that doesn't really tell you anything about disease. It is a measurable number that indicates the correlation between two parameters, but doesn't really give you much insight into what the disease is. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna really, uh, the goal of this sort of presentation is to talk about cancer risk um, and how understanding risk can really change the way that we actually uh, think about what the disease is and what the risk, the word risk is actually covering up and why if you use these words like risk, you oftentimes are masking uh, the need to seek knowledge about what the risk really is. And 
And the idea here is that science is not really a formula, but rather it's an approach. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about risk here and why it's important, and a little bit of the ways in which that can develop some of the ideas about how you formulate new kinds of scientific questions. And I'm going to talk about, um, for colon cancer, what the cancer oncogene is. These are the genetic components of a cancer that drive the tumor sort of relentlessly uh, uh, as it's developing. And we consider the tumor the target of drug therapy, sort of smart drugs, and that's the way in which a lot of medicine is being developed. But the tumor is not always the, 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 the oncogene is not always the correct target. And I'll show you a little bit about why that might be. And it's not really a villain. Sometimes the oncogene is there and it's not being treated correctly by the environment and it wants to be controlled. But the way in which the uh, disease is developing, it is hard to get that gene to be controlled. So we can also look at it as something that is looking for uh, some kind of replenishment of a lost activity. And the context uh, of colon cancer, this is the colon here, and a gigantic size. Uh, and these are the sort of uh, types of approaches that uh, Jeff was going to mention and Ken mentioned about this, what it's called finer, uh, of developing questions that are feasible, that are interesting, that have novelty, that are ethical, and, and it doesn't so much uh, play that too much role with uh, uh, the first part of this talk and that are relevant. And so, uh, but the, uh, it spells out this acronym of FINER. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about is cancers uh, and factors, fa factors that increase the risk uh, of colon cancer uh, as an example of a way in which we can understand uh, what risk might be and how we can deconstruct it and actually extract some valuable information out of it. And one of the number one risk factors uh, for uh, colorectal cancer is high fat diet. And not far behind, essentially co-linked with that, uh, is obesity. Um, and you know, this is something that is true for many cancers, and like actually very many diseases, is the high fat diets and obesity are risk factors. That is, they increase the probability uh, of developing uh, a disease. And oftentimes, they're linked to inflammation, in this case, intestinal inflammation. Of course, if you have a family history, that's a risk. Doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. But if you do have family uh, history, you, there, your risk is increased. Again, that doesn't tell you what risk is. Um, and uh, also, the inverse of, of high-fat diets and obesity is sedentary behavior. We, we exercise less because we have computers and lots of convenient things and cell phones that really reduce our physical exercise and aging, which is the, literally the age-old uh, big risk factor uh, for many diseases. So um, what does risk actually look like? And this is kind of what uh, I'd like to uh, explore for colon cancer in the beginning. And this, we can actually physically look at one of the risk factors, or two of the risk factors, actually, because they, they overlap with each other. And not surprising, obesity and high-fat diet uh, are linked. Uh, and here is the sort of gradation uh, of the sort of oranger you are, uh, the heavier you are as a state um, and per person. And so you go from uh, the greenest, which is Colorado, uh, and oddly all the West uh, Coast states are much lighter uh, than the Middle or the East Coast states. And that's a really a reflection of many different kinds of cultural things and the way the diets uh, are in different kinds of environments. Um, and Mississippi is the heaviest state. Um, and so you can look at weight uh, and, uh, uh, and high fat diets uh, in these surveys and you can monitor all the time. And I can tell you that the trend for the last 40 years has been only one direction. 40 years ago, there were no uh, dark red and only a very few of the, uh, of the, of, uh, the deeper oranges. And so we've just been progressing uh, steadily in one direction. And so how does obesity and high fat diet relate to cancer? Well, now this is the cancer map. And what you can see here is the risk of colon cancer going from 31% uh, to uh, over 50% as you progress along. And again, uh, Mississippi is the number one. And this 
indicates the overlap between obesity and high fat diets and colon cancer risk. And so that's why uh, high fat diets are considered a risk factor for this cancer. But that doesn't really tell you why high fat diets are bad or what the word risk means. And so that's what we're interested in defining is what are the molecular events in, in colon cancer progression that are linked to uh, these parameters. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the nature of colon cancer progression. Yes, please, absolutely. The working definition of obesity here. Obesity? Yeah. Uh, so usually obesity uh, is, is based on body mass index, uh, which is a measure of the relative amount uh, of adiposity uh, to, uh, typically it's done by waistline actually now. Um, and it's re really easy to measure, and they can measure risk that measure obesity uh, relatively easily. And the way it's done classically is by belt size. In this, this, the sale of belts in dif different states, so the size of the belts tells you uh, the average size of the people in those states. And they can also, and it's very uh, closely correlated also as well to fast food chains. The number of fast food chains. Uh, in a city is also linked to the obesity risk. Houston, as a city, Houston is, is based on that, has the most fast food and is also the heaviest city. So, um, so risk uh, and, and high fat diets are linked in, uh, and we measure it that way. Now, so how do we get to, to the cancer and, and dial this in? And, and colon cancer is a sequence of events. It can begin with a genetic mutation it will begin with, typically with a genetic mutation, um, which are shown here as, as a progression, and oftentimes this is a gene called APC. Uh, it's a, a gene for what's called adenomatous polyposis coli, which is just the fancy name of saying you're getting polyps. And that's why we have uh, uh, um, uh, 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 exams for polyps. Um, and. Uh, and those can be removed if it's early before the disease progresses to something that is more aggressive. Uh, as uh, the longer it's been there and not detected, then you can accumulate other mutations, such as called KRAS. This is a driver that cooperates with this initial mutation to increase the proliferation and gives you something called an adenoma. This is a type of local cancer. It doesn't spread. It's easy to remove, and if you can get something at that stage, and that's why they go for polyps, you can really uh, eliminate disease progression, but that's done surgically. Um, then uh, it progresses with more mutations, uh, especially through P53, a gene that Jeff Wall uh, is known for studying, and that becomes the carcinoma. And the carcinoma then is the stage that, that predisposes this cancer to both being harder to treat and also to escape the colon uh, and become a metastatic tumor which spreads throughout the body. So you get this, this gene progression, it happens in different stages, um, and so it's this, it, this evolution of, of a sort of set of mutations that drives this uh, forward, and somehow the diet affects this uh, process, this cancer progression is, correlates with this Western style diet. Now, I'm interested in what triggers uh, these transitions and why diet accelerates this process. And so how does diet contribute to risk? And so, um, this is not, here we go. So, uh, and what we're calling it is Pandora's box. And the point of this is that, from a scientific term, means we don't know. You just know there's something in there that is not good. And if you open Pandora's box, something bad's going to happen. And so, and that's what these mutations do. It's not so much the mutation is the bad guy. The mutation can't resist opening up the box. Uh, and the box uh, is then our job to define like what is in the box. Because if you can define what's in Pandora's box, then you have a lot, of different, a lot of new opportunities to think about how to actually keep them in that box. But if you don't know what they are, uh, then you're not gonna find out, you're not gonna be able to understand what uh, uh, is driving these, uh, these uh, tumors forward. And so, we're gonna, we wanna understand this and maybe intercept that process so that if the box starts to be opened, you can close it. Um, and the last thing to leave Pandora's box, by the way, is the, uh, uh, is the spirit called hope. That's the last one that's hanging on. So, um, so I, 
we use this just as uh, a way to think about colon cancer. Some details so you know it's the third leading cause of cancer death, 145,000 cases a year, a third of those approximately will uh, die per year. Um, uh, uh, has multiple different kinds of prognoses depending on how that set of genes uh, uh, gets set up and also depending on your diet and, and other features that are other risk factors. Smoking is in there and alcohol as well. Uh, understanding the drivers can really help understand the way which we can use therapy and outcome, uh, but uh, success has been compromised by we don't really understand a lot of the key factors. And so the gene, the, the, the therapeutic options are very limited because of the mysteries that go on. And so and it's very hard to define risk, and that's one of the reasons why we decided to try to do that. And we created a little simple uh, diagram here uh, to look at cancer risk. Um, and what a variant of this idea was described by Bert Vogelstein, the colleague on the East Coast. Um, and ultimately for cancer to, to, to happen and to progress, you have to increase the replication of the tumor cell, which is often in the part of the colon called the crypt. That's where the stem cells are. And you heard uh, Ken talk about stem cells. Uh, and normally that replication is controlled, and the tumor, change, the changes in oncogenes, just let that control, uh, the break on that, uh, begin to uh, be less effective. And so, and Bert says it's just random mutations that are causing the problem. So uh, that's the bad luck, is you've got, just got a bad mutation. But there are other factors, it's hereditary, that is, did you have family risk? Did you, are you born with a mutation already? Uh, and environment, this is the diet and other kinds of components that are here. So this is familial components, uh, and this is the Western diet, and these will somehow, we know, uh, influence the ability to open up Pandora's box. So let's just talk about uh, how that might happen. Uh, and by doing that, begin to see the link between risk and cancer from a more mechanistic point of view. Now, uh, uh, Ellen mentioned uh, in the introduction that we study something called nuclear hormone receptors, hormone receptors for steroid hormones, thyroid hormones, vitamin A, vitamin D. These are all uh, controlled in similar ways uh, by the vitamin or the, or the hormone itself interacting with a partner called a receptor. And for us, the receptors we study work on genes. So the way in which steroid hormones work is they control gene networks involved in stress, for example. Um, and there's an, another type of uh, steroid-related molecule that you all have heard of, which are bile acids. Um, and bile acids, which are shown here, actually, besides the fact they're produced in the liver, they're stored in the gallbladder, and as soon as you eat, they're released from the gallbladder into the intestine. Now, we think of, of bile acids, and there's 30 different kinds or so in humans, as being detergents that solubilizes the fats and allow you to absorb the nutrients. That's sort of what people think. But in fact, that's part of it. But of these 30, a good fraction, about a third, are actually informational. That is, when they're released, these are hormonal signals. And the difference between a hormonal bile acid uh, and one that is just for a detergent is almost nothing. It's a, these are, there's single oxygen changes. And so this, I call a bile acid a pool, these 30, a liquid organ, to our own term. But if something is released and it spreads throughout the intestine while you're eating, but 95% of that is resorbed back into the body into the bloodstream where it circulates and all that informational stuff is going around touching many organs. And so um, this, is a common, uh, this is a common bile acid here, uh, chenodioxycholic acid. It, this looks very, this is like a standard steroid hormone, looks very close to vitamin D. Um, and modifications of this, which is shown here, this is actually an FDA approved drug. Uh, by adding this group here uh, becomes, and, and this change here, this became an FDA-approved drug for the treatment uh, of uh, a certain type of uh, 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 cholestatic disease in the liver uh, called PBC, um, uh, uh, primary uh, biliary cholestasis. And this is a, a very tough disease to treat. 
Um, and they're treating uh, that disease with this bile acid derivative. And the way that that works is, th is that inf these are informational bile acids, these two. And they, first the bile acids come in, uh, the amount of bile acid is directly related to the amount of fat and high fat diets that you eat. So if you eat a higher fat diet, you need more bile acids to bring it in. And the liver responds and produces more. You eat a very high fat diet, you get a lot more bile acids, and you'll see that in a minute. Because the bacteria are in your gut, the microbiome, they've learned over millions of years of evolution to make enzymes, the, their enzymes in the, micro, in the microbes that metabolize the bile acids that are being brought into your intestine. And why do they do that? Because they inactivate it, and by inactivating it through a little metabolic process, they add an amino acid onto that, then that bile acid becomes a different property. They've changed the information. And they can change it from a good bile acid to a bad bile acid in a fraction of a second. And so they're smart. And they are uh, really uh, good at evolving tricks. And so uh, the, the way in which these molecules work, and one of the ways is we study a hormone receptor called FXR. Uh, it's a bile acid receptor. Um, and uh, FXR works to control bile acid production. It's a sensor for bile acid production. It controls the, all the transcriptional genes, hundreds of them that are present in the gut and also in the liver that are involved in energy homeostasis. It brings energy in, causes you to store it, moves it around the body. Um, and so it's a genetic program that is all being controlled by what you might call this liquid organ. And so here are the components that we should just think about uh, briefly, uh, that in terms of managing nutrients, uh, they're, they're coming in uh, through uh, the stomach and intestine. They are, uh, the bile acids are released, and then the nutrients are absorbed, and they then bathe other tissues, include the pancreas, adrenals, kidney, and other parts of the body. Um, and so FXR is expressed at very high levels um, it's very hard to see I think, in, 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 but in all these tissues here. And so it's a nutrient manager at a genomic level. And that becomes important because we have ways to take advantage of that. And last thing I'll mention about uh, uh, some of this uh, uh, in the way it works um, is that uh, they are, there are about 30 species of these uh, and uh, they interact, many of them, with about a third of them, with the receptor, a third of them don't. Some are designed just to suppress the microbiome. Uh, some are designed to, to uh, bring nutrients in. So we're gonna look at the hormonal ones if we can. Uh, but the very important point here is that the bile acid composition changes by the food that you eat. If you're eating a plant-based diet, you're gonna have one kind of bile acid composition because you don't need to have a lot of the, the super, what are called hydrophobic uh, forms of these, that more lipids, which, which are opposite of water, you need special forms of bile acids. And so the composition is dynamic in this liquid organ. Um, and this is the natural molecule that will interact with our target that we've studied for about 20 years uh, in the intestine uh, and then trigger a series of responses that communicate between the intestine and the liver and other organs. I'm also going to mention, and this is the last time I'll show you this particular molecule called FEX. Uh, this is an FXR synthetic molecule created here at the salt. It's chemical. It mimics the action of the natural molecule, but because it doesn't look like this at all, the bacteria don't recognize this. They've never seen it before. There's no way they can evolve anything to touch this molecule. So if, they, if the bacteria are attacking these molecules, we can come in and potentially replenish the missing activity. And I'm going to show you how we do that and what the consequence of replenishment is and what the oncogene, what we call a villain, might be actually asking uh, for help for. Um, and so uh, bile acids and colon cancer, there's a certain number of issues that are worth uh, considering. And this is about asking the right questions. How does this uh, receptor FXR govern intestinal function? Uh, how do high fat diets impact the bile acid pool? How are, the, how are these diets accelerating uh, colorectal uh, cancer progression? And can we take advantage of this? Is, there an, is FXR a therapeutic target in colon cancer? Uh, so uh, bile acids, I believe, are early sensors uh, of the high-fat diet. 
Uh, they're natural ligands. And so what happens now to the intestine uh, as we look at, if you put a normal intestine uh, on a high fat diet. And that's what this is right here. Uh, this, is a, a, this is from a mouse. Uh, chow diet's the normal diet, sort of the regular uh, diet that you might eat, which is a low fat diet. And then a uh, high fat diet is rich in uh, long chain fatty acids and lots of cholesterol uh, uh, in that diet. And typically if you have a healthy gut, the gut has a certain thickness which is indicated by this particular arrow here, shown here. And it, the, the sectioning is done uh, slightly differently, but here's the, here's the thickness when you're on a high fat diet. It's much thinner. So you can see the distance here, it's about a third. So there's a thinning out of the intestinal membrane. Uh, and these shortened epithelial cells are now under much more stress uh, in trying to manage things. And that creates a pro-inflammatory environment uh, that begins to create uh, problems uh, due to the high fat diet. So the conclusion is that simply by changing the diet, you are actually changing the structure uh, of the intestine, which is the actual organ that needs to be in good shape to absorb the food you eat. And you can see how that year after year, uh, that can be a real stress on this tissue. So um, if it changes the structure, what, what about function? Okay, oh, there we go. And this is a big one of the big, yes? Does it depend on the types of fats? It does depend on the types of fats. It's a very good question. Um, and Ellen briefly mentioned that there might be what you call good fats and bad fats. Um, and so uh, uh, the saturated fats, um, these are fats that you might think like in butter. If something, if, 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 if something that is, is fatty and it's solid, those are sort of the, uh, the saturated fats. Um, and the unsaturated fats, or monounsaturated fats, because they have a few little kinks in them, they can't stack on top of each other. So those are liquid fats. And so it's easier to manage liquid fats than the solid fats. And so, um, you know, and we like steaks that are very mottled and have lots of fat. Those are sort of not the great fats, right? Because those are fats that are solid. You can see them, they're marbling, um, tasty, um, and it's fine if you don't do it all the time. But if you do it all the time, it does present a challenge because you have to adapt to that. And so, uh, and we know that these fats can change. The, now the, the appearance, the structure of the intestine, and now I'm gonna show you the function. And so here is uh, the, uh, it, we're now we're gonna work on this thing using this metric, hereditary or genetic mutation, environmental, which is the diet. So we're gonna look at two. We're gonna look at uh, mice that have the mutation that predisposes people to colon cancer, called APC, on a normal diet or a high fat diet. Um, and what we found, which was a big surprise for us, is simply by putting these mice on a high fat diet, what never happens in these mice is the progression to adenocarcinoma. They all stay in this stage here, adenoma, which they get and they'll die from that actually because it just, they don't spread, but it, they, die, it die, they die from blockage. Um, and, um, but with the high fat diet, they progress to a cancer form. So this is the first time that diet specifically has been shown to change uh, trans transition this alone. So uh, I showed you mutations that are required for that. Typically that's the model, but in fact, diet seamlessly replaces that. And so this is why it becomes a little bit of a risk. So instead of getting all those bad luck mutations, if you are driving it in another way, you can actually uh, uh, create uh, uh, additional problems that can accelerate this transition. And there are other markers here uh, that uh, are that are known risk factors uh, that can be measured in the blood that are changing with the diet as well. So how does disruption of this crypt villus structure, this is where the stem cells are, affect uh, gut physiology and function? Um, and um, here we go. Uh, and so there's a few things that, that are happening here that, that I just want to point out, which were surprises for us, and I wouldn't have to dwell on. This is actual real data, 
uh, but uh, we're still looking at the interaction between the genes and the, and the diet here. So, um, and uh, this is a wild type mouse, no mutation. This is the, the, on a normal diet, this is the level of serum bile acids. We all have serum bile acids in our blood right now. We have more right after a meal and during the process of digestion and stuff. Uh, if you're normal uh, and on a high fat diet, your bile acid pool goes up uh, about twofold. This is in, in your serum. That's how you measure it. Even though it goes into your gut, it all comes back into the serum uh, to move those nutrients around the body. If you just have the APC min mutation alone, but you're on a good diet, already you're, have, you're in the penalty box, right? Uh, and you're in the penalty box, you know, if, th if this is the penalty box for, for being on a high fat diet here, this is five minutes. Uh, and now you're in the penalty box uh, for a lot longer. Um, and if you then put these on high fat diets, you're basically in the penalty box for the entire game, right? And so you've now gone up from here to uh, about tenfold of your bile acid pool. That is a gigantic physiologic effect. I and mean, you know, it's hard to imagine what a tenfold effect is other than saying, think about how your salary would be if it was tenfold more or tenfold less. But um, it's, these are big changes from uh, the point of view of uh, physiology. And then another thing, that, yes? So is the idea um, just like by virtue of numbers, so the more um, bile acids that are circulating, um, the more opportunity that the microbes can modify those? Or? Well, now I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works. But the point here is that the, um, the diet and the genetic mutation, two separate kinds, are both triangulating on the same thing. That is, the, I guess, the underlying important question is that the diet does something, and the, without the diet, the gene is doing the same thing. It's changing the bile acid pool, which wasn't known that the gene, could, that the oncogene, could directly change the bile acid pool, which normally is only sensitive to diet. So this is why this is a particular disease, and this is probably why high-fat diet is relevant as a risk factor, because the actual gene mutation focuses on the same thing that the diet focuses on. So this is a process here, and you're going to see in a moment, that is a new concept that just is revealed by just exploring what risk is, um, is the, the coordination of two independent, very different kinds of events on the same thing, which are bile acid pools. It's more than just a pool. I'll show you this in a moment. Another way to measure some of the changes uh, are what's called intestinal permeability assays. This is so the more challenge or stress your intestine is, you get something called leaky gut. Leaky gut is just a way in which the gut barrier is not being well managed. So you get kind of a pro-inflammatory state. And these inflammatory cytokines also get into the blood as well. And a lot of people have intestinal inflammation. This is not an unusual uh, type of disease. But what's interesting here, and we know that, that if you do have inflama intestinal inflammation, that high-fat diets make that worse. And so this makes it about three times worse uh, in a normal. But it turns out this mutation, again, without any dietary change, the mutation gives you a big change in permeability, which is shown here. This is dramatic. And again, you get this combination effect when you have the mutation uh, and the high-fat diet together. So we're looking at these very dramatic changes, which were entirely surprises for us. So this work could have been done actually any time in the last 10 years if people thought to do it in a particular way. But because of our own specific interest in bile acids as, as informative molecules carrying information, uh, we focused on this in detail and came up with uh, some uh, really major surprises. And we call this physiologic convergence. When two different physiologic mechanisms converge on one thing, the convergence is onto bile acids, um, then we call this uh, physiologic convergence. This is a term that we entirely made up. One thing about science and discovery is if you make new discoveries, you have a chance to name it. And you can throw that name out and see what people say. 
Uh, but so we're, we're calling this physiologic convergence because it says naturally diet uh, and your genes converge on controlling bile acids. But if you have a stress diet or you have a genetic mutation, those are independently converging on the same thing. And so uh, you, if your genes are controlling your physiology and so is your diet. So uh, we call this physiologic convergence. And of course, in the context of the mutation in diet, uh, you get pathologic convergence. So this is the inversion of that process. And um, so you can be working cooperatively to sort of promote health, or you can be working cooperatively to be uh, in the more pathologic state. So this implies a synergy between two abnormal states as opposed to synergy between two normal states. Um, and you can have just one part of that equation be compromised or both parts. And so uh, I like the term because it then illustrates a way to begin to think about why risk factors go up in the context of these genetic mutations um, in ways that which you can think about modulating that because it's triangulating on a specific measurable, identifiable molecule who's not only we, do we know what that molecule is, and I'll show you what it is in a moment, but the relative levels uh, can be measured quantitatively and therefore redefine risk uh, in the context of a different way. So in looking at bile acid changes, I men mentioned there are 30 or so of these in our body. Uh, but not all bile acids are equal. There are 30. Uh, we looked at all of them. Um, and I'm going to just focus on one for the sake of time. Uh, and it's called Toro Beta Muricolic Acid. The M means it's from a mouse. Uh, we have, humans have what's called the oxycholic acid. Uh, and uh, the Toro is like um, in Red Bull, their uh, Toro, toro acid, amino acid um, comes from the bull. Uh, and this means it's an amino acid that's attached to the bile acid. And it's what the bacteria does. Um, and on a normal diet, there's very low levels. That's 0 0.05 here. On a high-fat diet, that goes, that, this uh, goes up uh, significantly higher, about three-fold. So a high-fat diet directly changes this one thing. And that's, if you see the scale here, 0 to 0 0.1, um, but I'm going to change the scale. This is the same scale, so it's really, that's the 0 to 0.1 as opposed to 1 up here. Uh, and I do that because if you look at what just the genetic mutation alone does to this, um, you can't even map it on the same scale. It's so, it's so much greater of, of a change uh, that is shown here uh, of both the genetic mutation and the combination of a high-fat diet. So you get a dramatic increase uh, of this single bile acid species with high fat diet uh, in the APC min mouse. Uh, and this change is huge. Um, and so this shows you the, another hidden factor, which is how diet, and again, this oncogene, not only change the bile acid pool, but the individual components are changing in individual ways because they are adapting to the conditions that are, that they can, that are being sensed. And, the, and again, the genetic change and the diet change are focusing on a molecule. So that is a real interesting fact, but it also then helps us because if there is a molecule, then we can begin to study the role of that molecule in the disease. Is this just, a, a just an indicator, a correlation, or does this actually participate in disease progression? And so, you know, as uh, Ken said, asking one question leads to another. Uh, and so at the, it's a series of questions that lead you to a progression from one answer almost always opens another door. And once that door is open, you can kind of find another door. So. This is, this is in the colon. So this, in, this, is, this is happening because this, this, this gene, you can have it expressed in other parts of the body, but this is the major gene that is mutated in the colon. For pe most people that have colon cancer, the vast majority have this APC min mutation in the colon. So it doesn't have anything to do with the production of the bile acid, but how it interacts with it, or? It, well, we, it, it does have to do with the production. So, but the point, the really important point here is that the, 
What controls bile acid production in the liver? And this is a part of another challenge for medicine. It's what controls bile acid in the liver is the gut. And the problem with medicine in the last 50 years is medicine takes things apart. So if you study liver, you're a hepatologist, but you don't study the gut. That's a GI person. Um, and if you study the heart, you're a cardiologist, but you don't study diabetes. Even though most diabetics have heart disease, the, the cardiologist handles lipids with statins. And the, for sugar, I don't deal with sugar. You go to someone else. No one looks at the whole thing. So really, the problem with bile acids, which you might think is a, something for the liver, you have to look in the gut. And the real masters of that are both what you eat um, and, um, uh, and your genetics. And so the control mechanism is, is remote. So it's all about the so secret is, is communication. Yes? So the signals from the gut are signaling the liver's production? Yes. Yeah. And, and the true secret about health, if you're really the inversion of talking about disease, and I'm, I'm currently in my lab is more, becoming more interested in the science of health, of which they're kind of related to each other. Uh, but the secret of body health is about communication. All organs are there, not just to be the organ, but they're, they're communicating dramatically with other organs. And the gut's is not just communicating with the liver. It's communicating with the brain. It's communicating with the adipose depots. It's communicating with the adrenal gland, uh, the kidney. It is, it is the biggest uh, endocrine organ in the body. Even though we don't think of the gut as an endocrine organ, we think of gonads or the adrenal gland or the thyroid gland as an endocrine organ. But this produces huge amounts of hormones. That's how I call a liquid organ. Uh, and that then sweeps around the whole body, uh, and uh, it will find the, the, the right tissues that need to be regulated, but in a pathologic state, that can become dangerous. Okay, and just to see, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, um, you did about the flora and fauna of the microbiome, too, as well. Like, how would that influence what type of biologists are, how much the quantity and yeah, so the question is, does the microbiome influence the bile acid uh, pool? And it dramatically influences it. And so there's two things that happen. The bile acid pool has a big impact on the microbiome composition. Certain ones flourish better when you have these pro-inflammatory bile acids. Others do better when you have a different class of uh, what we call the symbionts, or the good bacteria, and the pathobionts, which are linked to inflammation. And they're just doing their own thing because the pathobionts have an advantage to metabolize lipids and fats. Um, and so they're producing all these secondary bile acids, which are kind of pro-inflammatory. They slow things down, and they let microbiome bloom uh, increase. And so, um, so not only do you change bile acid composition, but you're changing the microbiome composition with what you eat. And all these things play a role because they're all dynamically interacting with each other. So it's a, good, it's a good question. The other thing is, so if we look at tumor size and you look at the progression, there is a direct a link here. So that uh, makes us suspicious of whether this is not just a correlation, but maybe participating uh, in tumor progression. And so we then decide, let's just take out of the 30 bile acids, let's just take this one single bile acid uh, and see if we give this bile acid, um, will the bile acid by itself mimic a high-fat diet, in absence of giving any food at all, will it trigger, will, will the body see this as a high-fat diet signal? You got a question? Yeah, um, uh, a while back you suggested that many uh, bile acids seem to be uh, as much informational as uh, a speech uh, Do the IT folks come in and suggest how to measure the information content? Is there like a bit per mole unit? Um, since you bring up the term information. Yeah, so, when I, so yeah, I, I, and I know what you're getting at, but when I say information, um, that is that they're not simply trying to be detergents to solubilize the lipids. They interact with a, a nuclear transcription factor, and so that they're controlling uh, genomic networks. And the networks they control 
include things like bile acid transporters uh, and nutrient absorption pathways in mitochondrial genes. And so it's all about nutrient homeostasis. Um, and so, um, so the information is the way that hormones, uh, like steroid hormones, will change your behavior, they'll change your stress response, that sort of thing. Um, and so as opposed to cholesterol, which is less informational, it's just you don't want it to accumulate a lot in your coronary arteries. Um, but it's not changing gene expression uh, patterns that way. It's more acting just as a bad lipid. Okay, let me, before, I, I'm, I'm gonna get into the red zone, uh, and then Donna's gonna pull me off the, with a hook, she moved closer, I can see, so. Uh. All right, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of bring this, I'm gonna kind of bring this home. I'm just have another 30, 40 minutes. Um, okay, so uh, ju just to get to the, uh, the uh, a, a little bit of data that is, uh, I, I wanna tell you about, is looking at this part between the environment uh, and, uh, and uh, the changing uh, proliferation rates, is that this, uh, this single bile acid, uh, when we give that, uh, is, and that's gonna be all the orange bars, is able to suppress FXR target genes, because all these then get lower when they're orange, and to raise all the genes involved in cancer stem cells uh, and uh, proliferation markers. So this, uh, bile acid gives you a, a, a change that is very similar to what the diet uh, uh, gives you in the change. And so um, uh, it uh, is sufficient to both block FXR, so it's an antagonist instead of an agonist in vivo, and it activates uh, these cell proliferation genes uh, in the process of doing that. And the, uh, Ken mentioned a little bit about uh, organs on a chip. Uh, we have created these mini organs. One was the eyelet, another is these uh, working on intestinal organoids, and we're, we're interested in getting the human body on a chip. And he showed you this scheme where there's a cascade uh, of uh, events that produce certain kinds of organs and cells, and here's the gut. And from this uh, sort of a lineage, we can make uh, intestinal organoids, or these are mini organoids in a dish and then you can use these organoids to begin to do types of screens for information or try to find new therapeutics. And we use these quite actively uh, in our studies uh, as a very faithful way of, uh, uh, of mimicking a functional organ. And here is an organoid that we created as a, a uh, intestinal organoid. And the point of this is when we, this is the good organoid uh, growing uh, in, uh, in the dish, but when you add the toro beta mucolic acid, you can see it just the, the organoid gets out of control. It really starts to expand and proliferate a lot more, and this is the measure of the proliferation here. So it means that uh, in our um, metric, um, don't worry about that, I don't know what happened there, uh, that this is able to drive proliferation. Uh, so that R, there becomes a big factor just by that single one uh, uh, change in adding that taurine to, to this bile acid means that the genetic and the dietary pathway uh, focus on this, or in humans it would be uh, deoxycholic acid, and that then normally hits this receptor, but uh, 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 and what it does when it's this one is it turns that receptor off. Um, and so uh, we now have a way of kind of defining what risk is in a much more specific way. I'm going to uh, um, not take you through that. I'm going to, and I'm not going to take you, well, I'll just show you one thing here. Uh, these are ways of looking at the impact uh, of um, treating with our, that FXR synthetic molecule that the bacteria can't see called FEXD. Um, and what's shown here is the, uh, uh, this is the leaky gut, and you can see with FEXD uh, that even though it's leaky, if you replenish the activity of, the, of FXR, uh, things calm down uh, 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 in this assay. Um, and so in both the adenoma and in the adenocarcinoma state, that's true. Um, and if you just look at the BA pool, I'm just gonna go right over here um, 
that what you can see is what FEXD does to your bile acid pool, even though it's out of control here. Uh, you can see the change uh, from normal. Is look, look how dramatically it works. And so this is the oncogene saying, I need help. And if you come in with help, you can really calm things down dramatically. So this gives rise to so you start to look at what is risk. What does it look like? Oh, it's a bile acid. Things are converging on that. It's blocking FXR. Maybe if we, re we, re we, we allow the bile acid receptor FXR to be activated again, we can kind of pull things back from the cliff. Uh, and so uh, that's basically, and I'm going to just say that this works in a couple ways. It also, if we give FXR, extends life of these animals. And that we're very excited about. And we, we do this in mice. But we get a gene signature about what has changed when we give FXR ligands here. And then we go to a human database. This is the human database. And we ask patients who are in colon, with colon cancer in a human database, if they have the mouse signature that we have for FXR, they are at lower risk and they actually survive longer. So I'm going to end. Donna will be happy. Uh, with a diagram here about what is happening for FXR, how it closes the lid on Pandora's box by putting the brakes on. Uh, here also puts the brakes on this proliferation and DNA damage component to actually give us a new way both of understanding uh, uh, colon cancer um, uh, and uh, in conclusion, by deconstructing cancer risk, we reveal what uh, it is, as well as what it covered up about tumor progression. Uh, this then unlocked an entirely new way to think about cancer therapy, and also some of the good ideas on how to lifestyle, as well as new types of drugs can, uh, can make a difference here. I'm just going to end by thanking Ting Fu, who was the great postdoc that did a lot of this work, and here's the, the, if, the finer questions that we were trying to address. Uh, take home messages by asking the right questions. Science makes the impossible possible, and there's the impossible burger. <laughs> so thank you guys for uh, listening to this presentation.